A Pulitzer Prize winning author explains how God is the most common theme to all our stories. Marilyn Robinson on God at Work, next. Our world, busy and chaotic, seems to be speeding up by the second. And finding time for the things that matter is getting more difficult. So where does one find personal value in today's hectic North American lifestyle? And how can we possibly balance our needs with the demands of our jobs? Today on Context, Lorna explores what makes a healthy work environment by talking with experts on the value of bringing your faith into the workplace as we delve into the emotional benefits of bringing your whole self to work. We'll also sit down with Pulitzer Prize winning author Marilyn Robinson to discuss how God has influenced her writing. How important is it to take your faith to work? For Pulitzer Prize winning author Marilyn Robinson, it's vital and it's resulted in culture shaping and we'll get to her story shortly. But first, we caught up with Anita Bromberg, the Executive Director of the Canadian Race Relations Foundation to find out why they've launched a national conversation on faith at work. On a cold winter day in Toronto, a group of people have gathered together to put together principles and practices that make workplaces more inclusive. Funded by the Canadian Race Relations Foundation, or CRRF, these are workshops which focus on establishing more integration in the workplace, specifically for religion and religious tolerance. Anita Bromberg is the executive director of the CRRF and she speaks to the importance of bringing your whole self to work. If you look at what identifies us, faith has got to be part of the conversation. Canada is a country of diversity. Diversity can be measured by many aspects, but faith is very much part of the diversity story of Canada. Religion is already not just a part of our private lives. I think that certainly for people uh, from faith communities where the uh, religion dictates how one should dress, what one should eat, um, where there may be guidelines around how to conduct one's interpersonal relationships, I would argue that that's already part of the public sphere and not just something that is private. One of Anita's goals is to broaden the understanding of diversity. Diversity is a very positive force in Canadian society where it allows people to bring many different backgrounds together to heighten creativity and productivity. But diversity tends to be thought of in terms of the color of your skin, your gender, your, your, whether you're abled or disabled. We, we still are uncomfortable with the concept that religion is part of diversity. And if you're asking someone to come to work and asking them that, to park part of their essential part, you are making life very difficult for that person, obviously, but you're doing something else. You are losing the benefits that we've already identified under the concept of diversity. So we're trying to open it up and make space for religion. If I am at my workplace and I don't feel comfortable, obviously I'm not going to be that productive, you know? So it's, it's, it's the benefit of the employer that I be productive, and if I am sort of, I feel happy about the, what employer is doing for me, I'll be going maybe a mile long distance uh, to make my employer happy because I'm happy. You know, often I go to events and it's done on a holiday, or people can't come because it's a holiday. Um, if planners would, you know, look at the, the different holidays and then take them into account when they're planning their you know, meetings and functions, I think that shows respect for the different interfaith groups. From a legal perspective, employers already have a, a duty to accommodate, um, but certainly it is a two-way street and the onus is to some degree also on the employee to identify um, what their needs are as well. So I think that if there isn't an open conversation, then people aren't going to be giving their 100% to their workplaces. Uh, if you, you don't feel like you can uh, approach an employer with an accommodation question, um, then it's going to affect your morale and it's going to affect productivity. So I really do think it's in everybody's best interest to kind of make an effort to understand the people that are, are working for you. 
but again, by the same token, as an employee, you have an obligation to kind of bring forward uh, what some of your, your needs might be. And if you ask me to leave part of myself at home, how am I going to be productive? My experience and my lens means that I can be committed to the workplace if I bring my whole self to it. So first we have to understand that religion is part of what people are. That, again, I go back to saying that doesn't, that doesn't mean that you can carry out uh, practices that infringe on other people's privacies. We have to have discussions around, uh, you know, what's humor to one person may be offensive to another. What smells good to someone in someone's microwave might not smell so good to someone else's microwave, you know? But how do we deal with these issues? Well, we can wait till it's an adversarial situation or we can be open to the fact that we come in different packages and we bring different lenses to uh, our everyday lives. And why can't we celebrate that? Just as much as I think people would accept that we should celebrate people coming from different countries, different cultures, well, they also bring their religion with them. I think we have to um, not be afraid to tackle the question of religion and religiosity uh, and to just, again, open up dialogue so that we can have conversations about it. In the end, you're building a workplace uh, that is strong, that has the commitment of, uh, of its workers, that that people are ready to dedicate themselves. It's a win-win, if you will, for everybody. Pulitzer Prize winning author Marilyn Robinson has found a way to step into the world's literary stage with a love story about God. Her novels capture the romantic tale between an orphaned girl and the minister who takes her as his wife. Along the way, she draws the reader into the emotions that most of us deal with sooner or later in any relationship. I caught up with Marilyn Robinson on a recent book tour in Toronto to discuss her new book, Lila, and the effect that God has had on her writing. All of your books have loneliness and isolation as their main themes. Why? I think that's a very um, important human experience. I think that loneliness is uh, not confessed to particularly because it's somehow associated with failure, I think, in many cultures. I mean, the, the failure to make meaningful bonds and so on. But I think that in their privacy and in their innermost experience, loneliness is important for probably everyone. So Lila has this amazing ray of hope, the most loneliest of girls meets a minister, Reverend Ames. What are you trying to develop in having these two encounter each other in this compelling love story? Well, one of the things that I want to do is enlarge the world of faith, the world of religious experience that John Ames, you know, sort of epitomizes in its more conventional forms, you know, I'm not using the word conventional uh, disparagingly, but a woman comes into his ken who is totally outside the vocabulary, the conceptual world that is so central to him. She's completely unchurched. Utterly unchurched. But he sees the sacredness in her. The, his sense of the sacred is, is expanded through her. The gospel does say that God loves the world you know, and this is something about the world that God would love beyond, beyond culture, beyond doctrine, beyond all those things. She also really challenges his assumptions about God. Where do you want us as the reader to go with that? I frankly wouldn't mind challenging people's assumptions about God, you know. Um, what have we got wrong about God? Excessively narrow understanding of him, I think, in almost all cases. No matter what the understanding is, it, it tends to, I think, inevitably diminish the sense of God, what God is. You know, I mean, what God is is almost a meaningless statement. Is, you know, language could not be sufficient to answer a question like that. Um, but nevertheless, if we become content with narrow definitions, then we're falsifying, I think, the whole uh, gift of religion and religious consciousness. So let's just take this back a little bit. How did you begin this? How did you begin your relationship with God in your life? 
I have no idea. I don't remember not believing in God. I think it's. I think you find this actually in children very commonly that the idea of God comes extremely naturally to them, and then somehow or other they are distracted or teased away from it. Um, but I, I simply remember, as far as I can remember, assuming God. You know. Um, I don't. I never went through anything that you would call a conversion experience or anything. It was just a sort of deepening. Tell us about your understanding of how Jesus fits into the human race's current struggle to find God. Well, I think that one thing that Jesus means as a cosmic statement is that human beings are sacred that humanity is invested into being. You know, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. Without him, nothing was made that was made, and all that sort of thing. The idea that uh, sort of the Christ figure as an original holiness means that humankind participates in a, a profoundly in the holiness of the cosmos, and that if we were adequately respectful of ourselves in those terms and adequately respectful of other people, that a great many problems would go away. That's a different way of looking at Christ than I expected you to hear. I've always felt, you know, there's this repair job that Jesus was for the human race. You would have us take it back even further than our to need for repair. Yes. I think that one of the great questions in, in contemporary discussion about science and religion and so on. It comes down to what is humankind? How do we fit into reality? And it seems to me that the statement that you get at the beginning of the Gospel of John and so on is we fit in, in it's about us. We are intrinsic to it. And the Christ presence at the origins of reality mean that we as human beings are the center of being, of incalculable value. So there can be no understanding of what God has made us to be, what our purpose is to be, unless we take it right back to that origin with Christ, in Christ, the beginning, the end, the all. Yes, we have to understand, I think, the universality of human sacredness, that there is a I, I mean, I think that Christianity means that, but I think if we create a barrier between Christianity and the world at large in our conception of things, we're making the huge mistake of excluding this fundamental sacredness from our thinking about the world, the whole human world. And so as you write, you almost purposely obscure the divine in your, your literary style. Why? Uh, well, you know, I'm in, I am quite consciously act in the tradition of, uh, you know, the transcendentalists, the 19th century Americans, and uh, they made God implicit in experience rather than being, you know, part of some sort of cosmic structure that put him at some sort of imaginary remove. Um, I'm, I'm interested in, in God as, as uh, saturating reality, not as, as uh, isolated from it. The authority that we have given to reality at the level that our senses perceive it is an error because now we know enough to know that reality is much more complex, much, much more diverse than we have imagined. And so applying these sort of uh, positivist tests to credibility and plausibility and so on, that's simply primitive. There is no basis for it. And the mystery of God is all over it for you. Yes, well, yes. All your work on thinking about uh, God and the reality of our lives has been heavily covered by uh, all the leading press. You've, you've won a Pulitzer Prize for your work, New York Times, The Atlantic, everyone writes this up. Lila's been one of the most talked about books. You've done wonderful work with this new release. Um, why do you think your expression of faith in this way that is somewhat obscured, yet deeply connected to the reality of our lives. Why is it so widely talked about and accepted? I think that uh, the public is mischaracterized as being 
unreligious or a hostile religion. I think that, um, sadly, certainly in, in America, there's an association of re religion with certain political positions that many people can't accept. And, uh, and so they step away from the whole thing and are very silent about it. But I think that many people are implicitly religious. And, and uh, it's only when people sort of draw battle lines and become exclusivist that people begin to recoil from it. Marilyn Robinson, the uh, author of Lila is your latest book. Thank you very much for this beautiful novel. And thank you for being with us today at Context TV. Great pleasure. Coming up, how faith at work can increase your emotional health. So this week, for your chance to win a free book at Lorna's Books, we are featuring the Pulitzer Prize winning author Marilyn Robinson's newest novel, Lila. I love this book because in Marilyn's own words, it brings out the sacred thread in each one of us. I think you'll really enjoy this copy. Uh, write to us for your free copy at contextwithlorna.com. This segment is brought to you by Bruce Etherington and Associates. Family harmony and philanthropy, helping you help others. Well, today we're talking about faith at your job and joining us are Pete and Jerry Scazzaro. They've authored several books on the topics of emotionally healthy spirituality, including Pete's new book, The Emotionally Healthy Leader. Pete, you pastor a diverse congregation. You've got working poor in Queens, New York, and you really feel they have something to teach us about taking God to our jobs. Well, we have people from 73 different nations in our church. And so they're coming from all over the world as well. And so they're concierge, they're the sanitation workers, the social workers. We have to say they're the invisible people in Manhattan that service everybody else who comes. But uh, they have a tremendous amount to teach us about authenticity, mm -hmm. about humility, about hunger and thirst for God. I think about what's important in life. Jerry, what have you learned yeah. from watching these, these people who service Manhattan? Yeah, I think that um, even though we can come from all kind of strata of life, and can be very different socioeconomically, educationally. We're really all the yeah. same, um, especially you know, especially on the inside. And um, just their their yes. their maybe their a healthy brokenness, a healthy openness to learn and to change. Pete, you're a pastor. Your own approach to work had gotten so toxic that, Jerry, you were miserable and you blew the whistle. Tell us what you did. So after, I guess it was about eight years into working very hard to plan a church and establish a church in New York City, in which we started out with no money and no people. And I was birthing churches and birthing babies at the same time. And so there was lots going on. Uh, we were going 24-7. It was very difficult. Uh, we had some staff, but there were staff were getting maxed out, very tired. We had lots of crisis. We had never-ending needs of people. And I just, uh, year one, I was tired. By year five, I was tired. By year seven, I said to Pete, I don't know how much longer I can do this. This is not the life that I wanted to be living. Um, and he was, he'd always say to me, just one more year, just one more year. And finally, I reached a point where I said, uh, I don't want to live like this anymore. Um, I felt like a single parent. And actually, I had gone to him at one point and said, you know, it would be easier if I was single as a single parent, because then at least he'd have to take the kids on the weekends. Yeah. And so I, he was like, a, was right. he a workaholic? He was, Pete, yeah, he was, he was a workaholic. Um, um, I, would, I would use the word driven, very driven. And so finally... Uh, I just said, I, I don't want to do this anymore. This church is giving me, bringing me death, not life. So I quit. And I, I started going to another church. So I didn't quit the marriage, but I quit the church and started going to another church. And then I had his attention. Okay. It did grab your attention about the way you approach your work. What, what woke up in you? What, what, what happened? Mm -hmm. First of all, it woke up. I wanted to kill her. But after that, um, I realized that uh, there's some things wrong, broken 
in me. So it actually got me to actually look, begin looking inside that uh, what's, there's, there's, some, there's some deeply broken things here that go back to my family of origin that I've got to look at. So it stopped me. I mean, it's, it, was, it was the most loving thing she could ever have done for me. It saved my life. It changed my whole life, changed our whole family, mm. changed our whole church. In mm. some ways, I mean, it's changed tens of thousands of people all over the world. Mm. Her one decision is to say, I'm not going to participate in this pathology anymore. All my family workaholics. I mean, we own family businesses. We have a family Italian pastry shop that's still going from 1923 in Brooklyn, New York, and my cousins are now running it. And uh, it says my, you never stop. And my, my uncle works seven days a week. He's 78 okay. years old. Okay, so how did you stop, Pete? What, what do you do? If that's my, the way you're wired generationally even, yeah. and all of a sudden you're faced with, I'm behaving in a toxic way because of what work is doing to me. I love Jerry and our marriage and our kids, uh, but I, I was aware that there was something really wrong with me. So I, I just, it was, it was God. It was, it, was, it was a God moment. And I realized that I was emotionally immature, that I was an emotional infant leading a church, that my own wife didn't feel loved by me uh, because I was so busy working, that I was gaining the whole world and losing my soul. Something was really wrong with my whole spirituality. And uh, it was a, for me, it was a God moment. It was like, I like to say, it was like being born again again. It was, a, it was like a, a, I was blind, but now I see. I just saw it. It all opened up to me, and I realized what's true spirituality, and I said, I'm missing the whole boat. Okay, so you had a couple conversions. Both yeah. of you decided we're going to change some things. Yeah. Give us one or two of those. What what did you change? Uh, I, I would say, well, next to changing the way we did work, because before that, we had no awareness of all the unconscious stuff going on inside of us, what was driving the way we did life. There was lots of unconscious behavior. Um, you know, the, the need to succeed, the need to please people. Yeah, and the financial and, pressures are real for people. Absolutely. Yes, and um, so, and I, I would say another big one was marriage. That, wow, once we decided we weren't gonna live like this anymore, and we really got to uh, discover intimacy, you know, especially emotional intimacy in our marriage, we were like, there's no going back. Yeah. We will not sacrifice anything for that, that so, glory. So, so practically, what had to change? If marriage was our priority, then we were going to begin with, the, the calendar would start with not everything you have to do in the week. The calendar began with, okay, where first and foremost is time for us to be sharing our lives with one another. That became the most important thing along with our commitment to Christ. And then everything else flowed out of that. Very practically. I think a number Just of, the calendar. Yeah, that was huge. A number of things became clear to us. One is the gift of limits. Mm -hmm. That limits are a gift and therefore mm -hmm. began to work a five, five and a half day week. That was gigantic. That's true. Being was more important than doing. Right. Uh, I think we discovered the whole contemplative dimension of life. Uh, silence, solitude, Sabbath, mm. a rhythm of Sabbath and work was gigantic for us. Mm -hmm. uh, we shifted our entire life uh, right. in terms of being with God, being with each other, loving people. Spiritual maturity became defined as approachability, uh, warmth, uh, humility. Loving uh, well. Loving well versus gifts, power, size, all that. Oh, yeah, yeah. That was a gigantic yeah. change. What difference do you think emotionally healthy spirituality can make in people's workplace? Oh, we were just talking about just on a, coming here, just a number of examples and, and to share. I mean, everything from one woman we know in our church, actually, yeah, she runs a dentist office. And so uh, people have gone in there and she, she's brought, she, she brought her employees, paid for them to go to a marriage retreat on a paid work day because knowing their marriage is going to impact their workplace. Uh, they've learned skills on how to deal with angry patients coming in who are angry about their bill and complaining and how to speak clearly, respectfully, uh, honestly, in a timely way, um, how to listen well, uh, how to resolve conflicts, how to deal with expectations. I mean, she's just brought all of this into the workplace and it's changed her whole, her whole office. Uh, the whole atmosphere is different. Uh, mm -hmm. Dawn White. We have a teacher who runs a huge musical for her school. Uh, once a year, involves many families, kids. You can imagine families, kids, schedules. But with learning, with learning skills for emotionally healthy spirituality, she's now communicating with them. In, first of all, she's seeing them as people. Mm -hmm. And she's got a very, you know, um, she's treating everybody with dignity, sees them, is present with them. 
uh, isn't making assumptions, isn't doing mind reading, is clarifying expectations, respecting their schedules. So there's so much going on in terms of uh, the folks in our congregation learning the skills. I call them skills to love well. Yeah, and, and it's about setting some boundaries and not being able to do everything. Absolutely. Lots of quitting. And that family, the family so appreciate that she is recognizing their limits and their boundaries. Yeah. Well, Peter and Jerry Scazzaro, authors of the Emotionally Healthy Spirituality series, including the Emotionally Healthy Leader, which releases very soon. Thank you both very much for being with us. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. It's great to be here. Coming up, my final thoughts on how to bring your whole self to work. I'm Rose Meter. I'm a mom, a wife, and an ER doctor in rural Canada. This year, my husband Rob and I have decided to take our four kids on a trip around the world. We have no idea what lies ahead. I'll be updating our journey on the Context with Lorna Duick website with blog posts and videos about our triumphs and trials and adventures. Won't you join us? Here at Context, we love to hear from you, our viewers at home. Recently, David wrote, your show is ridiculous. Hopefully no tax dollars are funding this garbage. Well, David, you'll be happy to know that our show is entirely funded by our viewers. And we'd like to take this opportunity to say how much we appreciate your donations to help us share Christian stories. Thank you for helping us make television we can all be proud of. Well, everyone except for David. Missed an episode? Catch up with our podcasts. Get up to date on the latest conversations from beyond the headlines. Simply go to our website, click on our link to find current and past podcasts on iTunes. It's free. Don't delay. Today we were challenged to put some faith into our work. So how do you pay attention to what God might want to do with your job? especially if you work at a place that does not love you back. Well, how about this for a start? Work in a way that means we see the neighbor beside us and the impact our work can have in repairing the world. Our choice to live out the biblical command to love may be the very best thing we bring to the job. Sometimes it is a spoken idea, sometimes an action, sometimes not a word is said, but love is our motivator every day on the job. God's way is that we all work to make the world a better place to be. Check out more on our website or Facebook and catch more episodes on our podcast. For all of us, I'm Lorna Dewitt. Thanks for watching. Join us next week as we explore life beyond the headlines.